Welcome to the JuxCast. I'm Dominic. In this episode, I speak with my colleagues, John, Alex, Joanna, and Carlos, about Crux, Edge, what it's like being new in the industry, and a small debate about closure spec. Okay. Welcome to the second episode of the JuxCast. So, um, I think we're just going to try and organize it a bit better and have some topics on the agenda. So, the first topic is Juxt news. So, does anyone have any interesting Jux news to share? So, this week we uh, had a Crux Night at Funding Circle, our friends at Funding Circle, who we hosted, and we had a Night of Crux. We gave a talk on Crux, the essentials, the architecture by Jeremy, uh, that went particularly well. We gave a talk on what is bitemporality, and Malcolm gave a talk on JSON Schema. The videos will be online, and we shall post a link to them very soon. Other bits of Jux news. It is rather Crux themed this week. Uh, we, we've had an internal Crux conf. So this is where we've taken a step back and we've looked at uh, the, the launch for Crux and um, how that's gone. We've also started to look at the roadmap. So some v fairly exciting things, I think, on there. And uh, there's going to be some good things coming uh, Crux's way that I hope will show people uh, how easy it is to use. It's not just this academic, esoteric, weird, bitemporal thing. It's actually a very easy to use tool for whacking your data in and doing queries. So uh, we hope to show you uh, how accessible Crux is. So I'm excited about uh, Crux. I'm tired from Crux night on Tuesday, tired from Crux conf, uh, but it's been awesome. And um, I, I'm very excited about XT20. So July 10, 2020, we are planning it now. We have an awesome venue. It's like a Victorian music hall. And we have a theme, which is uh, Victorian cyberpunk, hard, hard working, old school tech, like HG Wells Time Machine, that sort of uh, thing. It's really cool. So, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll release some de details soon. Uh, we're starting the planning process, but uh, yeah, lots to come in that area. Very exciting. And uh, what about on open source? So, so Dominic, you're, you're the edge guy. Uh, anything exciting in edge? So there's been this error in Edge for a while where when you jack in from CIDR, if you jack in Closure and Closure Script, if you type go into the wrong grapple at the wrong time, uh, it basically just blows up in your face. Um, and I, I kind of expected this was a, a race condition in Integrant, actually, because I assumed what was happening was that two systems were trying to start at the same time and that was causing this port exception. Um, but after tracking it down, I actually figured out that there was a there's a race condition in FigWheel. So FigWheel tries to be very helpful, uh, and it says, uh, "Oh, you don't have a FigWheel server started. Let me start one for you before I I, I do anything." Of course, if you're already starting a server, um, those two servers are now going to conflict. So I added a little workaround to Edge for that, so that that bug is now gone. So the Emacs users can rejoice again and, and not have to worry about typing Go at the wrong moment. And just for people who don't know what Edge is, could you give a, an explanation of Edge and why you should use it? Yeah, we should back up a bit. Yeah, so it's, it's hard to describe. I don't want to say the, the term framework because it's not quite a framework, but it's definitely in that category. I, I use the term foundation because it's very lightweight and it's, it's, it doesn't actually have an opinion about like what web server you should use or anything like that. Edge is really, it's basically all the code I got tired of copying between different software projects. Because, because we're a consultancy, we work on a lot of projects. So I've seen various development systems and, uh, and I just got kind of sick of seeing A, the same code copied and pasted over and over with slight tweaks uh, and B, like improvements not being made where we can all share them. So, you know, you'd work on one project and it, would, it might have a really cool, completely kitted out dev system, but the, you know, maybe the system part is, is wonky or, um, you work on a different project, the dev system's quite naff, but the the system part is really cool. It works, loads from the config.eden. It's all data driven and, and you know really funky. Um, so basically it was the goal was to just pull everything in one place where it can be reused, it can be updated, and because you know frameworks are always broken, it's also designed to be very easily tweaked. So you can override anything because the code is in your repo. So it's there to be changed. You can use it for starting any kind of application, not just web applications, even though that's where the documentation is focused at the moment. It can be used for non-web applications as well. It's, it's very useful. Cool. 
And uh, is it, am I right to say that you've got some tutorials on Edge planned? Yeah, so there's been a, a massive overhaul to the documentation recently. I uh, generated a brand new uh, version of the doc site. I added a couple of documents answering questions I got a lot, like how does Edge work under the hood, a small tutorial on writing your first component and getting started with, er uh, with Edge if you don't know what you're doing at all. And, uh, and as part of this work on the new documentation site, because I'm now controlling the HTML and how it's generated, I've made it a lot easier to write tutorials that don't break. Um, so now that I have this superpower, I'm going to use it. And I've, I've started writing the, the basic outline of a tutorial for uh, creating like a, a journal application on top of Edge. See, so um, Carlos here is our newest addition to yeah. Juxt. As someone new to Juxt and to Clojure, I guess, have you had a look at Edge yet or? I've been playing a bit with Vent. Yeah, I mean, well, at least the Vent tutorial is, is very nice. It's all very reactive. You just modify your code in an Emacs and it just applies immediately, reloads uh, the whole thing in in the development environment and you can just uh, play with the app. And yeah, it's got a really nice tutorial following all the steps, made all the exercises and yeah, all, all run, yeah. runs good and smooth. Yeah. We, we should, is Vent public at the moment? Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We should leave a link somewhere to Vent. It's sort of, what did we use it for? We use it for like a, well, we, we started hosting a Funk MK, what are they called? Meetup group, a user group sort of thing yeah. um, in, in Milton Keynes. And the idea was to basically take a bunch of programmers who did not know Clojure and to give them a, a feel for Clojure. Uh, hence the, the whole highly reloaded workflow because we wanted to give them that r like really grasp, like this instant right. interactive feedback so, development. Yeah, so I'd say it, was, it wasn't aimed at like a total beginner to programming. No, you could, yeah, you could muddle through with no knowledge and uh, you'd find it reasonably easy if you had the basics of the syntax, yeah. Yeah, so it, yeah, if you're, if you're still new to Clojure, I would recommend checking that out. And what, what else have you discovered along your, your journey so far? Um, I usually used uh, always a learning game for managing projects, and what I saw with Edge is it doesn't have any of that. So the first time it was like, how do I run that stuff? And actually, I learned about all the... Uh, I think it's a Deb CDN, isn't it? Yep. How everything works and its structure, which is, I think this is sort of the basic primitive way of Clojure by itself, by default. And I knew nothing about that. I thought it was all managed by Lightning again or Boot or, you know, all these managers. I know that there was a good... Um, yeah. There was a good thing. I learned... I, I quite like to learn the internals of how things really work instead of what people have built on top of it. I always like to go, like deep down and have a real understanding of things because otherwise you just know about higher abstraction layers that do things magically. But oh, yeah. yeah, when it comes to a real problem, you need to debug or you need to do something. If you just stick in the higher abstract layers, you you never know how to fix yeah. some problems, you know? Yeah, that's that's a good point. Mm. And I think if you only ever use Linegan, you you don't really know how what Linegan is doing because yeah. it's just got its magic. And when you do Absolutely. want to do something that Linegan doesn't really bend to, it can be quite difficult. I mean, I, I guess it all comes out of the uh, the idea. Linegan tries to be a very sort of magical toolbox. It mm -hmm. does a lot out of the box. And, and it basically, where you run into limitations with Linegan is where things are trying to interact um, because like, because it's it's not ordered. There's no. It's sort of a graph, and things just have to try and like hook each other and, and try and figure it out. Uh, Depths. Eden has sort of taken a radical simplicity approach to this. It's just like write a program. Programs are ordered. They know how to to check things out, how to look for their dependencies, and it that that simplicity and the fact that we can actually build like uh, like pack is pure closure, and it's just a simple program. And there's no hooking needed if you want to uh, coordinate it with your closure script. You write a shell script, or you just run two commands one after the other. Um, so it's it's a really it's, it's quite novel and it's really interesting. It, it, you do lose some of the conveniences you had with Linegan. So for example, if you you have any Java in your project, uh, Linegan will auto compile that pretty much when you start it up. Whereas Depths.Eden has no facilities for building at all. But I think it's pretty clear as time goes on, we're not going to be seeing much of an improvement in Linegan. Whereas the Tools depth sort of ecosystem is going to grow a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm actually really interested in the work that I think his username is Flyboarder, but I can't remember beyond that. But he's he's taken over boot development 
And I understand that his goal is actually to turn Boot into an API so it can be used from depths.eden. The idea being that Boot will be the program and depths.eden will fetch the dependencies. Mm. Something to track. So we also have here today, we have Joanna. And Joanna came and did an internship with us last year, having had zero programming experience. Well, um, I always say my very first dealing with programming was was with C, and I, I didn't like that very much. And then the next year, we, we learned how to plot a few plots in Python, and that was a bit more fun. Um, and then I started the internship here, having never even heard of Clojure. And I really enjoyed it. I really liked it. I feel like from hearing a few stories, I've I've been spoiled a bit and I'm kind of dreading having to use anything else. But I, I think it's great. It's really, really good. Yeah. So now you're, what are you working on at the moment then? So um, I am working on a bit of crux. Um, I am in the process or at the very beginning of making a nice tutorial series for that. Uh, as John was saying earlier, we want to make it a bit more accessible, um, easy to use, because it is easy to use. Um, but to a, an absolute beginner, especially like me, things can seem quite scary. So I started working on Crux. It seemed very scary. What's going on here? After a week of digging around a bit, it's, it's not that bad. It's actually really easy. So I'm, I'm making a, a tutorial series that's hopefully going to be quite fun. Nice storyline. Won't spoil it yet. But it, it's good fun to write, and I'm, I'm learning as I'm going. So that's nice. Sounds exciting. So so at CruxConf, how did Malcolm's uh, talk on JSON Schema go? What was the general theme? Because he wasn't sure uh, when I spoke to him last. Yeah, I thought it was a very good talk. It was it was short. It was to the point. It was definitely worth a watch if, um, if the video has been uploaded by now. So Malcolm has, I think, kind of a couple years ago, he was very into GraphQL, right? Mm-hmm. And over time, I think he's now gone over to the side of JSON schema. Actually, there was there were some people asking me why <laughs> why Malcolm prefers JSON uh, schema to GraphQL, and I I didn't have a good enough answer. So, do you know? I mean, I guess part of it is that GraphQL is, while it's REST compatible to a degree, I, it's a massive departure from REST. Um, so something like JSON schema is quite quite a nice sort of uh, middle ground, well, along the lines of, of what he's thinking about anyway. You need to combine it with certain other ideas. Like it's not, I wouldn't say JSON schema and GraphQL compare. Um, maybe something like JSON API or, or one of the, or maybe JSON hypermedia, which is sort of being built on top of JSON schema. Maybe that compares a bit better to GraphQL. Right. But it, it it's a lot more uh, in line with Roy Fielding's ideas of this sort of like relationships and being able to traverse and links and... Uh, showing types and generating forms automatically. Um, right. I think also, like, it's quite nice to have something that's actually structured, that's mm. actually data, whereas GraphQL is a meta language on top of... Uh, it's just it's a, a brand new language that you then have to write a parser for and generate however you generate it. Yeah, I think Malcolm's point in the talk was that as Clojure developers, all we do is throw around data mm. and everything is just a data structure. And JSON schema is basically just another data structure. You know, I know a lot of people complain about JSON and, oh, my commas in the wrong place and now it won't <laughs> compile. Um, but the thing about JSON is that it, because it's just a data structure, you can convert it to other data structures because if I want my JSON to be Eden, that's a one-to-one yeah. transformation and then the other point was that once you have this sort of json schema that describes the structure of your application you can use that to generate a ui you can potentially use it in crux to validate things going into crux and then one change to your schema can change the whole application mm -hmm. there's this problem at the moment in thinking closure with spec where people were trying to use spec to do validation everywhere like they'd have a CLJC file with a load of specs and then the forms in ClojureScript would go through that to validate and then the API layer would be checking the specs and you have some strong opinions on that, don't you, Dominic? Yeah, so, I mean, with, with the strong caveat that Spec2 seems to be addressing a lot of the issues that have been raised so far. Um, yeah, Spec1, really, I, I, I mean, you're supposed to do validation before you pass any data to Spec1. Uh, yeah. Is the uh, the official line I saw. So, um, if you're, for example, the big vulnerability is that if your endpoint, for example, takes Eden or Transit, 
um, and there is a very slow spec registered in the spec registry. When because spec has no uh, system for fil uh, doing like select keys or something like that, if someone sends a very long string to this very slow spec, it's going to bring down your server. It can DOS you from a single machine. Um, so it's and and as well, if you, if you go overboard with specs, it's like types, right? Like if you go way overboard and you spec everything all the way through your program for that that you know in pursuit of that purity. It's going to make working with your program quite horrible. It's going to, uh, well, A, if you have instrumentation on everywhere, it's going to slow it down yep. because uh, spec, well, it's reasonably fast, but it's not that fast. It does have a big overhead, which is why it's supposed to be disabled in production. Yep. Uh, and B, you know, you lose that dynamicness and you sort of, you're just throwing exceptions everywhere when you, as the responsible adult, know that it's fine for this map to go through here or... You know, you're just trying something out on a single function. You don't, you know, you don't want to have to update your whole program. You just want to test something out on this one function, see if it works uh, at the REPL first. Um, so yeah, that, that's the sort of and and parsing specs like going leading, uh, connecting back to Jason schemas. Parsing specs is horrible. Like it's basically a code form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just it's it's a bit of a nightmare. You, you definitely can't, although people have tried to generate error messages human readable error yeah. messages from spec because you're just going to run into a whole world of yeah. trouble there. Yeah, I, I don't think spec one has a good augmentation system or, or metadata system, essentially. It's, it's very difficult to like attach something to a spec. You have to sort of maintain an additional registry and then try and sort of pass and align things up. It is quite, quite painful to go through. Um, but I think spec two is sort of, I know they've separated some things out and some concepts. Um, Alex Miller on his journal has some great uh, diagrams of like his thinking and how they're trying to break it up. I know that so Rich did his maybe not talk, which is is really worth a, a watch if you haven't seen it yet. Where he sort of talks about some of the major mistakes in Spec One, um, uh, and it does pertain a lot to sort of the keys which are in maps and when you check those keys and and things like that. Uh, he actually said like, yeah, oh, I've I've made the same mistake as Haskell uh, in Spec One. So he's sort of uh, it's interesting. Yeah, the way it, the way it's evolving, but it does look like we'll have a facility for either strict key tra checking or non-strict key checking. Um, I think they're going to try and make the API for strict key checking a little bit painful, uh, with the intention of like you sh really shouldn't be turning this on. Like this should be an, right kind of an inconvenience to your, yeah. you know you should see this and it should stick out a bit like a, a sore thumb, and you shouldn't want to do this because. Because they don't, they want you know big maps to be able to flow through your system. They don't want its spec to be a burdensome, a burden on your program. It should just be a, a very natural thing that adds on top. 